A whole lot of lovin' is what he was bringing to racing for sure. Singer and actor David Cassidy, who passed away last November, may have one more tour to make, and it would be to one of horse racing's iconic destinations, we'll explain. Plus, perhaps the most controversial issue in thoroughbred racing is furosemide, otherwise known as Lasix, but how many people really know how it works? We'll talk to an author of a new leading study on the subject. Come on, get happy! In the Gate is coming up next. They're in the gates. They're about to move in. They roll sack. And they're off. As they move to the top of the stretch. It's a hip-hopping finish! This is In The Gate, ESPN's Thoroughbred Racing Podcast. My name is Barry Abrams. You can follow me on Twitter at B. Abrams Voice or on Facebook at Barry Abrams Voice. You can also get us on our YouTube channel by searching In The Gate Podcast. You can get us on SoundCloud as well. Get us at the iTunes Store or TuneIn.com. You can get us on that little pink podcatcher app on your phone you didn't even know you had. And now you can subscribe to In The Gate in the Listen tab of the ESPN app. For the full In The Gate experience, subscribe now in the Listen tab of the ESPN app. If you're of a certain age, as I am, you grew up watching a certain sitcom on television called The Partridge Family, about a single mother and her children who, on the show, collectively formed a popular musical group. The two most recognizable actors on the show were the incomparable Shirley Jones, who played the mother, and David Cassidy, who played the eldest child, Keith. The group released the number one hit, I Think I Love You, with Cassidy singing lead vocals. Then David Cassidy later released a solo album called Cherish that went gold, selling over 500,000 albums, and eventually became a solo performer when the Partridge family ended after five seasons. Was it only five seasons? Cassidy's career and income was such that he could indulge his other passion, thoroughbred racing. In 1974, the year after Secretariat won the Triple Crown, and the final year of the Partridge family show, Cassidy bought his first horse. He became very knowledgeable about pedigrees and owned horses for over three decades. His biggest win as an owner came a decade ago right here on ESPN in the Black Eyed Susan Stakes at Pimlico. And the inside sweet vendetta is trying to kick it in from fourth, and she's coming four or five lengths off the lead, but they turn for home, and she's all Elvish got some kick, though she lugged in just a bit. Now to the center, sweet vendetta trying to run her down. She's all Elvish, all out with one furlong to go. On the outside, sweet vendetta, Channing Hill rolling right by her. It's sweet vendetta. How sweet it is for Channing Hill and the Black Eyed Susan sweet vendetta. Where is the Partridge bus when you need it? David Cassidy's going to be singing all night long. David Cassidy died last November at the age of 67, but published reports say that his ashes have not yet been interred. Instead, they have been stored in a cremation unit since his death and will be spread somewhere on the grounds of his beloved Saratoga racecourse sometime later this month. There is a minor race named in his honor, which will be run at the spa on August 18th. During his career, he had even written a song called Summer in Saratoga. So what this basically does is give us a chance to remember the late, great David Cassidy. And to help us do this, we welcome to Win the Gate one of his better friends from the world of racing, Dr. Jerry Belinsky of Waldorf Farm in upstate New York. Welcome, doctor. Had you ever watched The Partridge Family? Well, I was at Cornell undergraduate and then in vet school, so I would say I certainly saw it on occasion, but my wife, 18 years my junior, and she was more of a fan. Well, did you know who he was when you first met him? Oh, yeah, of course. I certainly heard of him, and he was a prominent horseman up here at, at the time as well, but I was actually introduced to him by Kenny No, who was the CEO of Naira at the time, and David wanted to bring some horse mares to New York, and so Kenny No recommended. He called me, and we spent about two hours on the phone talking horses, so we got along fantastically. And then he brought his mares here, and then he would come up during the August meet and stay at our at our home. Really? What was he like as a horseman? He knew his pedigrees, and he knew. Uh, the ins and outs of the horse business, because he had had horses years ago when he was still high-level musician and singer. 
but I think that he wasn't as involved. I think it was busier then, but at this point in his life, he had more time. So we talk about breeding and so on. And uh, he would come and visit his horses here. And my wife, we had horses in his name and her name. That was her hero. And, you know, whatever makes your wife happy makes me happy. And then that <laughs> made David Cassidy happy. Smart man. It was all cool. So we would spend a fair amount of time on the porch smoking cigars. And we just, you know, couldn't stop talking. Just always something to talk about. What was it like hanging out with him? Well, he was a friend of mine, but again, I was enough older to him that he wasn't like, I wasn't starstruck. And uh, we go to the track and people would uh, show up at the track and come by the box that David and I would be in. And the uh, young, well, the middle-aged ladies would be asking for his autograph and and then asking uh, to get a photo. And one time I was sitting next to him in the box and I had my head down and he, he sort of pushed me in the shoulder and, and, I, and I looked up and he said, girl, want your autograph? I said, me? Yes, you. So I said to the young lady, I said, well, who do you think I am to get my autograph? She said, well, aren't you D. Wayne Lucas? <laughs> I said, well, actually, actually I'm not. But no, we go up there at the track and have a cigar outside once in a while and he he would bet once in the great you know but not 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 extensively and he liked watching the races and he enjoyed betting him and he enjoyed the farm and watching when he was sit out on a porch and watch the horses getting brought back and forth from the, the field into the barn and my wife of course she got all the, the paraphernalia we bought his old boat we bought his old jaguar we got a guitar he signed and all that stuff <laughs> because that was her thing. But we'd go on and on and on and talk. Then I'd go to Florida in the winter and I'd stop and see. Sometimes I'd stay at his house down there. But we actually went to uh, Wem- Wembley St- uh, Stadium with him. He invited us to go. He was doing a gig out there. So we went out there. And uh, that was uh, fun as well. So we became good friends. And he would come up every year up here and stay the month of August. And, you know, that was that. Did he ever talk about what made him so interested in racing? You know, I, I would say I don't have any recollection of anything specific. When he was here, we rode horses. Well, actually, he came here a number of years in a row and performed at the local Humane Society fundraiser. And one year, he and I rode horses into the tent But, well, you know, he had a dog, he had a bird, he had other dogs and other pets, and he loved his animals. He wasn't one to, if he could make a few bucks to get rid of something, he'd keep it, which is not my way of approaching horses. I like to make hay when the sun shines, but he'd, he'd always fall in love with them and keep them. And he had some good horses. We're chatting with Dr. Jerry Belinsky of Waldorf Farm in North Chatham, New York, when was the last time you saw David Cassidy? Uh, it would have been the summer before he passed away. And uh, he had come up. It was uh, sort of apparent to us that he was having you know, problems with uh, u- using uh, uh, alcoholic beverages, uh, as everyone knows. And I think it's part of what you see on a lot of famous people. It's, you know, it might look like it's nice to be famous, but sometimes you want, you got to be careful what you wish for because you don't have a life of your own at all. And that was the last time. And then the following summer, he didn't come up. And then I think it would make me, what was it? What time of year? It was in November he passed away. Yeah. I can't remember now. Yeah. That would have been that November. But he was in rehab one time, and I went down and visited him in Florida. You know, he was trying. He was trying. But again, as a person with fame, sometimes you're alone, and people are always trying to help you, but sometimes uh, you're not sure why they're doing that. And, uh, you know, when we would go to the racetrack, we, he would sometimes we'd want, he'd want to avoid people. 
just so he could be be by himself and enjoy the races himself. Because there was a line that would be there to get his autograph and the photo taken. And, and then I went, I went to, went to a number of his performances, and I was always amazed on how vibrant and how amazing he was when he performed. He would be so almost become a different person on stage. In person, he was quiet. He'd always say, "Hey, Doc," and he'd give me a hug. And he's probably the only man I I ever hugged. Now that I'm thinking about it, and um, <laughs> I could tell we were just he just had a lot of positive thoughts for my wife and I, and uh, and uh, of course we had the same ones in return. It was just sad to see see what happened, and uh, we miss him. And here we are, August. <clears throat> As I say, next week they're having the fundraiser in his honor. I think there's a race. Memorial race in Saratoga in a couple of weeks as well. Yeah, that'll be on the 18th, and the tribute concert will be on the 14th. There's a David Cassidy tribute concert, and according to published reports, his ashes will be spread somewhere on the racetrack grounds, presumably somewhere in that time frame. What do you think about that? Well, you know, it, he he loves Saratoga, and, you know, I think that he looked at a lot of the other venues at Las Vegas and in California, more of a paparazzi type situation. And in Saratoga, he could be himself or in the country. It's, you know, obviously it's more in the country and uh, it doesn't surprise me. Uh, I, although he and I never spoke that that would be a, a, a wish of his, I can s- certainly see because of my experiences with him that that would have been some place that he would have thought that that would be a final resting place for his for his ashes. He delivered the keynote speech at the 2005 Hall of Fame induction, which of course is in Saratoga. And in the speech, he called the spa the greatest race place of all time. To paraphrase the Partridge Family theme song, which I used to watch all the time, he spread a little lovin' and he kept moving on. So how would you sum up Dr. Belinsky, the David Cassidy that you knew? He was uh, a genuine person. He was a friend. He would acknowledge his fans. And uh, he was smart. He was intelligent. And again, I'm not sure how he learned and when he learned, but he knew all the various backgrounds of the pedigrees and so on. And uh, mainly for me, he was a, a, a great friend. A great friend. Well, thank you so much for sharing a few minutes with us. The remembrance of David Cassidy will take place, in, as we mentioned, in a number of different ways this August at Saratoga. Thank you so much, sir. My pleasure. My pleasure. Now, David Cassidy loved Saratoga. In fact, sometimes he loved it a little too much. Four years ago, Cassidy was due in a New York court on a drunk driving charge. He wanted to work out a plea deal, so his lawyer said Cassidy couldn't make the court date because he was being treated for alcoholism in Florida. But very shortly thereafter, very shortly, the New York Racing Association tweeted a photo showing Cassidy surrounded by a group of friends at Saratoga. So much for the plea deal. We're going to take a short break here on In The Gate, but when we come back, believe it or not, scientists don't truly know how the most controversial drug in thoroughbred racing really works. We'll talk about the nuts and bolts of Lasix when we come back. Welcome back to the In The Gate podcast. It is almost undoubtedly the most controversial topic in American horse racing today, the use of furosemide, commonly known as Lasix, for horses on the days they race. Lasix, a diuretic, cuts down on a horse bleeding from the lungs while at full exertion. But here's the thing. Scientists, believe it or not, don't truly know how Lasix actually works. They know it reduces bleeding in the lungs, but not how that actually happens on a nuts-and-bolts level. But a recent study in Brazil, published in Comparative Exercise Physiology, has filled in one piece of the puzzle of how furosemide works. The study took place at a racetrack in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, and it established a relationship between giving a horse Lasix 
and the presence of an enzyme that affects blood pressure in a horse's lungs. Could this finding open up new ways to treat bleeding in the lungs for racehorses? Well, let's ask the study's lead author, Dr. Maria Fernanda de Mello Costa, who joins us here on In the Gate. So first, Dr. Costa, what was the goal of the study when it began? Well, basically what happens is that I've been studying um, ACE, which is endocrine converting converting enzyme, since 2007 now. I did my PhD on it with um, under the supervision of Professor Ron Slocum at the University of Melbourne. And we were looking into the effects of exercise, basically, on this enzyme that has to do with blood pressure, basically, very simply put. So we decided to... Um, look into what could be the relationship between this enzyme and blood pressure. And since blood pressure has a role to play in, in the IPA, we decided to investigate if it could be related to the angiotensin converting enzyme. And what happened is that the first work that we did was basically investigating if there was any difference in the levels of the enzyme in relation to the exercise the race forces are usually doing. And then we decided to compare levels of the enzyme with horses that had e EIPA. And lastly, we decided to see uh, if the levels of the enzyme would be altered in any way by the administration of drosomide. So that's the last one. That's the one you, you were referring to, and that's where we are at the moment. So we wanted to see if there could be a relationship between the mode of action of furosemide in its reduction of the IPA and interest in converting enzyme, basically. Now, for those of us who are lay people, our explanation of furosemide, Lasix, has been that it's a diuretic, so that giving it to a horse makes him lose water. And that water would otherwise put pressure on the tiny blood vessels of the lungs, the vessels would burst, and the horse would bleed. But I'm guessing that it's not quite that simple. You're, you're absolutely right. It's not quite that simple. What happens is that the blood pressure in the lungs raises very rapidly when the racehorses start to run, and even if they are losing water because of furosemide, because of Lasix, that blood pressure can still increase very rapidly and still cause bleeding. And the proof of that is that even horses that race with furosemide can still bleed. So we know that, that the drug reduces the amount of blood that, that releases to the, into the airway, but doesn't actually stop the process of bleeding. So we, we were interested in starting to look into other possible ways of treating the IPH and reducing bleeding other than furosemide especially because I'm not sure if your listeners are aware, but furosemide is also a bronchodilator. So there are some instances where people tend to say that it could be considered doping as well, and it could be potentially cover other drugs and, and make the life of the blood, uh, the drug detecting a little bit harder. So what happens is that there is a, a search for other drugs and other treatments that could help horses with the EIPA. You tested some horses that had been given Lasix before a race and some that had not. From what I gather from the yeah. study, you found a correlation between furosemide and an enzyme that contributes to that high blood pressure. What was that correlation? Well, basically we found out that there was a difference between, as you say, the, the blood levels of the enzyme in horses that were still bleeding and horses that weren't bleeding. And in, the, in this study, both groups actually received furosemide. And we saw that there was a, an association between the horse being given furosemide and the level of the enzyme in the blood. And because the enzyme is related to blood pressure, we thought that potentially we could get a better understanding of how furosemide would actually work. We haven't actually gotten into the stage of testing this hypothesis because this was just a preliminary study. So we still have to conduct other tests to actually found, find out more about this, this the theory that furosemide will influence this enzyme and therefore reduce the blood pressure and hence reduce the possibility or the probability of the horse's feeding. We're chatting with Dr. Maria Fernanda de Mello Costa, the lead author of a new study on the effect of Lasix on racehorses. She's joining us here on In the Gate. Now, some of the horses that did not get Lasix in your study showed a little bit of bleeding, 
though about half as often as the horses who did get Lasix. But there is a scale of how bad the bleeding is, at least in racing, from one to five. How bad was the bleeding in each set of horses, those with Lasix and those without? Uh, what happens is that it, it's difficult to compare in, in the sense that the horses that do not receive furosemide, they might not be on the list of horses receiving the drug for two main reasons. One, because they haven't actually bled yet and they aren't allowed to take the drug. Or the other reason is that they aren't in the list of horses allowed take the drug because of their ages. So, for example, in the racing jurisdiction where this research was conducted, horses that are two years old and younger, obviously they start racing in two years, they're not allowed to take furosemide. And the horses racing black type, black type races aren't allowed furosemide either. So these horses that are not allowed to take drugs, they could have severe bleeding and, and higher grades of bleeding and still are not allowed to take the drug. So there, it wasn't a straightforward comparison between the levels of, of blood in the trachea. Horses that do take crossomides, again, in this racing jurisdiction, tend to be what we call chronic bleeders. So they might have been having episodes of the IPA for a longer period of time and actually have stop the evolution of the disease, so to say, and be usually around a grade two or a grade one because they are using the drug. So it's hard to compare the two groups because you would be comparing apples and oranges, but the horses without furosemide tend to bleed much more in the beginning, and then they go into the list of furosemide horses, and then the bleeding decreases. I'm not sure if that makes sense. I've, I've sort of babbled a little a little bit there. Yeah, I mean, once the furosemide actually takes effect, they're going to bleed less. Now, obviously, it's incumbent upon you to do a lot more testing here. So what do the results of this study mean in the debate over whether a horse should be given furosemide or not? Well, this research wasn't actually about whether horses should be receiving furosemide or not. It was more about discovering more on how furosemide actually act on the body of the horses. So we weren't exactly um, judging whether furosemide was good for the horse or not. We know from other studies that furosemide does reduce the degree of bleeding, and that's the only effective drug to do so. It's the only one with scientific evidence of such. So it wasn't really about undermining, if you will, the use of furosemide, but rather try to discover more about it so we can then try to derive other other drugs or other methods to try to reduce the bleeding and potentially one day treat really treat these horses. So we, we thought that one way forward would possibly be investigating other enzymes and other substances related to angiotensin converting enzyme and investigating more about the role they play in reducing blood pressure or or stabilizing blood pressure, both during exercise and at rest. Are there tests for other enzymes on the horizon? Are there studies, I should say? Yep, yeah, we're basically um, at this stage conducting, which will be the second part of that study, which is evaluating horses before and after they took furosemide. So the same horses will be measured before they take furosemide and after they take furosemide. That will be a step forward to actually demonstrate that the enzyme is changing or the levels of the enzyme in the bloodstream are changing because of furosemide. And if that happens to be the case, then we have some other biomarkers that we'll be willing to test before we try to go into the, the, the realm of, of treatment, per se. Well, we look forward to welcoming you back to hear the results of those studies. But for now, thank you so much, Dr. Costa, for sharing this study with us. Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure to talk with you. Our thanks to Drs. Maria Demela Costa and Jerry Belinsky. When Justify walked out of Del Mar Racecourse recently, where for the fans the champ was on parade, it represented the final glimpse of him walking on a track any thought of an encore race was just a charade. The deal had been struck to sell the horse for breeding to Coolmore. With bonuses, the price was 75 mil. There was no way the horse would run until that deal was signed, and then his left front ankle showed some fill. The deal's not signed, not till September, because of new tax laws, so the current owners would all be on the hook. 
But when American Pharaoh kept on racing, the deal was done. It was a risk Coolmore, not the Zayats, undertook. I don't know what could possibly keep a cult like Justify active. The economics are too hard to ignore. But that's one of the many problems the industry must address. When the stars are here today, then seen no more. You can get us on our YouTube channel by searching In The Gate Podcast. You can get us on SoundCloud as well. Get us at the iTunes Store or TuneIn.com. You can get us on that little pink podcatcher app on your phone you didn't even know you had. And now you can subscribe to In The Gate in the Listen tab of the ESPN app. For the full In The Gate experience, subscribe now in the Listen tab of the ESPN app. And you can follow me on Twitter at B. Abrams Voice or on Facebook at Barry Abrams Voice. That's In The Gate for this week. I'm Barry Abrams. We'll see you next time.